Hey guys, Phil Montalioni, the book peddler, coming to you with another YouTube video. If you haven't, like and subscribe if you enjoy this kind of content. It's all surrounding my life as a used bookseller. And a part of that is doing some book reviews on booksellers of the past. And this is the book I'll be reviewing, My Kingdom of Books by Richard Booth. Thank you, my friend Mook, for sending me this book. It was very enjoyable. And before I get into this, I'd like to say that if you want to purchase this book, there's a link in the description. I'm a, an affiliate with Biblio now. <laughs> Excuse me. And when you go through that link, uh, I get a small percentage of the of the sale. And I'll uh, speak to, to my relationship with Biblio as we go forward in the future. Um, but that's the gist of it. Also, these uh, book reviews, informational videos that I make, they do take a lot of time for me to uh, put together. Like I have four pages of notes right here for this review. And uh, if you would like, there's a buy me a coffee link in the description. All those donations are for in-shop coffee for my customers um, at the book peddler that come through. Your donations are very much appreciated. We're going to do a thing for you guys who have donated. And uh, my customers thank you. I thank you. It's all coming from a company in Connecticut where a couple friends of mine run a, uh, a shop. So it's a and another small business as, as well. So thank you for those who have donated, and you're more than welcome to throw a few coins in there if you'd like. Now, before I get on with this review, I'm going to do a little giveaway. So I have uh, The Last Bookseller by Gary Goodman. I did a review on this. Excuse me. Boy, I did a review on this uh, last year. And uh, I'll link up a card if you'd like to check that out. Great book to read on, a, on, a, on another bookseller. And in order to win this book, what I'd like your help doing, and maybe it will push me to read one of these, is tell me what review you'd like to do next. I brought down two books. I kind of started them both, but I'd like to hone in on one here. So if you type in the comment what one of these titles you want me to read, I'll enter you uh, in a giveaway for the last bookseller by Goodman. And in my next video, I'll pull a name out of the hat. I'll pull your username out of the hat. And if you win, I'll send you a, uh, a message and a link to my email and I'll ship it to you free. Just a little something that I could do for you guys out there. I appreciate all your support. So the two books I have to choose from are book row an anecdotal and pictorial history of the antiquarian book trade. This is in New York city. So, Book Row or The Salamander uh, Letters, or it's, or it's called Salamander, The Story of the Mormon Forgery Murders, uh, was a guy who was an ex-Mormon who was forging documents. It's, it's a, like, a crime slash bookseller story, a true story. So, you enter into a comment of what one you want me to review and you'll get a chance to win the last bookseller by Goodman. So, all right. So I appreciate your participation if you choose to. Um, so let's get started with this book by Richard Booth. And I'd like to thank my friend Mook for sending me this book. <laughs> and it was extremely enjoyable book to read. I could have read it in two days if, if I had the time. It was a very easy read. And, and I, 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 I enjoyed the book. Um, immensely. Now, this review is going to also intertwine with my um, experiences in the book trade as well. I pull some things from it. I made a earlier video on sourcing books. I'll link up in the end card if you'd like to check that out because a, a bunch of it I, uh, I got from this book. I think if you're a bookseller today, you don't even have to be here. If you want to get in the trade or if it's just of interest to you, you can pull a lot of gems from books like this, from guys who have been in the business for years, their experiences. And I did with this book, and I also added my own two cents in that video as well, like I'll do with this one. Um, so I've been in the book trade for almost 10 years now, and uh, I find these things valuable and very enjoyable as well. So, guys, without further ado, let's get started. Richard Booth. The self-proclaimed king of Hay on Wye. He was a Welsh bookseller. He had he had a shop in Wales. Uh, and he he proclaimed to be the king of, of books, basically, of his area. He's a very interesting individual, very eccentric. There's a lot in this book that I wouldn't have been comfortable uh, revealing. It, it gets uh, some personal things in there, but it really adds to, to the dimension of this guy's character. You really get a good feel for who he was. 
And uh, there are dealers around me um, that I know who who dealt with Booth in the past. There's also individuals like Mook who went to visit his shop years ago. One of them, uh, Eric, a Midtown Scholar, who has a YouTube channel you can check out. Um, he's in Harrisburg, PA. At one of Eric's first book sales he did, Booth came and apparently bought everything. And this is what Booth would do. He would he would buy out shops. He he would uh, one individual I know who has a bookstore. Booth went through it, selected sections he wanted, made the deal. Then his guys came in with a shipping container and filled it the next day. So he spent a lot of money on books and. Uh, he filled it. He had like a castle out there and it's still in operation today. You guys can Google or YouTube and you can see that operation. He's dead now, but uh, it still runs today. Um, so I really enjoyed this book, as I said before, and uh, I, I'm going to get into this a bit. Um, one thing that really resonated with me as being a bookseller in the middle of nowhere was, uh, was, was this paragraph here. He says, my success as a bookseller was built against the background of manual work. I was thrown into the society of diggers of ditches, laborers, and woodmen. Rural pride enabled us to do a job others would have spurned. Pride in manual work, I believe, is the basis of any traditional rural economy. I hold a good manual worker in higher esteem than any intellectual. Working with just a few country laborers, I ended up possessing books of greater intellectual variety than all the universities in the British Isles put together. I really like that. It resonated with me because I'm in a very blue collar working area. And um, um, I also found that, find this to be true is that I found more gems in my little country area than I have when I've gone to the city or bigger areas. Uh, it's, it's just rich with wonderful material and more so interesting material than anything that I've pulled from, um, you know, academic professors. Uh, I don't know why that's the case, but it was the case for him. And it's also been the case for me. The The work ethic of the area really drives and it's almost like instilled, you know, I come from a family with a very strong work ethic and very strong entrepreneurial background. Uh, so I would say that plays an even bigger factor with me, but it, it does help that there is such a pride in work in ethic in in my area and i think that's uh helped in running this shop and continuing to push it forward it doesn't hurt the case at least now one of booth's mentors was a man named harry benz who was a legendary bookseller in south wales and uh he schooled booth in the ability to uh gain the confidence of the host the seller um of of, of material and um, Ben's had some uh, great ideas and, and did some really, uh, maybe some of it would be a little unorthodox, but ways of getting books. I don't think really anything is too unorthodox when you're in the, the book business. It's just, it's just thinking outside of the box a little bit to get material. Um, but Ben's most important thing they would uh, tell Booth or said to Booth was it was a relationship that you um, build. With, with with the seller. Um, he said a good book dealer will have the seller running around looking for books to set, for you to buy. And um, so Booth, Booth was very um, uh, uh, well-schooled in, in the trade from Ben's. Ben's would also do something called book knocking. He would go to the doors of people, knock for books, things that looked like it had great potential for there to, to be good material in the homes. One of Ben's uh, quotes is, follow the river, boy. That's where, like, the treasures were to be found. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because rivers were like highways back in the day. There are homes built up next to them. There was commerce going on. And a lot of these old homes next to rivers, maybe next to old canals that were once there, um, there there's the potential for a lot of treasure to be there, especially if it's a generational house. Uh, great grandma's books might be just sitting in the basement and uh booth's taxi driver also recognized when he he had some quote in the book about when you see people cutting down the trees in front of their homes for money you you know that they need some money that might be a good potential to give a knock on the door and again i made a video about sourcing books um and some of this information in a video you can check out in the end card 
But um, I found this to be very true as well. Maybe the house needs a coat of paint, whatever the case may be. These rural areas, especially generational homes, it's very difficult to maintain. And uh, there, there can be potential gold mines in these places. These people need money. You're preserving, saving books that would otherwise rot away. So it's and you, it's like doing a service, a, a pretty good service. So it's recognizing potential where others may not necessarily see it. Knocking for books reminds me of that American Picker show too. I, although it's you know very staged in certain ways, they have their list of what they're looking for. And they're knocking on doors and trying to get their foot in. Uh, they have their presentation. And, um, you know, uh, again, it's a tactic I, uh, to, to, to try if, if you have it, if you feel okay doing something like that. And try not to be intrusive. But, <laughs> you know, it's a little bit intrusive. You can catch people off guard a little bit. So it's having a little tact when you, when you do something like that. Booth also talks about how books are still uh, very undervalued. Um, they're, they're still regarded as worthless by, by many people. And um, that I've found that to be very true. He talked to a dealer um, who joined a local natural history society. This, this uh, proved to be beneficial and fruitful as he now had access to good material potential material that he could capitalize on. Um, and I've said before, like, this would be a good idea to join your local uh, historical societies, uh, things of this nature, you know, try, trying to, um, tr trying to whatever area you're in, figure out what you could join or where you could be helpful and also open the door for more material uh, to come in. You know, what's very interesting about these kind of places is, uh, People that you would expect to recognize value in books, whether that's libraries, historical societies, don't always necessarily do so. They're curating material of what's of interest to the local area. And so some of my best sales and best buys have come from these uh, places. So um, don't always, don't disregard them thinking um, maybe they've been picked over, they're going to want too much for them or yada yada a lot of these places don't really have the room for the material and they need to get rid of it so it's it's another good tip of advice booth had in his book now booth also talks about some of the mistakes that he made when it came to acting in haste uh selling too quickly without doing his proper research he thought he could cultivate a stronger relationship with other dealers by selling far cheaper than he should have for desirable works this is kind of twofold for me can be right, wrong at the same time. Uh, sometimes moving material out quicker is best. Uh, it's all about that cash flow. Um, but sometimes holding might be the best option. So do you have the resources to hold uh, material? And I'm going to read a quote from Booth also on page 51. S quote, Sublim subliminally, I learned the first lessons of secondhand book selling. Every book shop creates a museum of the unsaleable from popular theology to outdated novelists and political biographies the most vital lesson taught me what to avoid buying when occasionally broke i had to sell books back to Finner, finneron it's a bookseller and i realized the enormous profit margin he made one day i discovered a volume of 18th century pamphlets in a town junk shop and sold it in london for a 35 shilling profit at the same time, some of Hughes' friends were financing a life of considerable luxury by stealing books from the Bodkin Bequest, a fine antiquarian collection left to rugby school by an idealistic old boy. You can be a secondhand bookseller anywhere in the world, Finneran told me. If one advertised in catalogs, it did not matter where you lived. Well, same with the internet. I'm in the middle of nowhere. The internet and... Some people still do catalogs for sure. I'd like to at some point. You can sell to anybody anywhere. This whole thing about creating a museum, I see that happen a lot. Now, again, it's all situational. It, it depends on your stage. And some things are worth speculating on, holding. It's whether or not you are able to, to, to do it. It's also finding outlets for that kind of material that doesn't move. Um, Booth made an outstanding point in here about uh, doing these large book picks 
in Prado's Law that basically 90% of a collection is not going to be valuable or worth trying to sell. Uh, so that 90%, you got to figure out what to do with. What's your outlet to get rid of this material? So he basically said that 10% of a bulk buy was a value. Now, I believe it today to be a little bit higher um, because of the internet and and the use of getting out to the world. I think it's closer to 15 or 20%, depending on your margins and where they have to be. Um, but in eBay, maybe even ticks it up a little bit more because you can allot books together by author, by genre. So we do have more advantages today uh, than uh, Booth probably did to remove that excess material. That 90% is the service you're providing basically for taking the material. So make your offer accordingly. Also, I would say what a number of uh, booksellers might have a problem is, and maybe it's just me, but uh, is when you pick up this book five, six, seven, eight times and move it to another thing, a lot of another area. A lot of it is moving books around. So if you can set up a system in a process where you don't have to touch this book more than once, all the better. You're going to save a lot of time. Um, people get death piles created, those who are reselling. And, um, you, know, you know, it's it's addressing these issues. It, it's coming up with that system so that you can move more fluidly and not take all that time dealing with the 90% of the material that's unsaleable or the 80%. Uh, this has been a struggle for me in the past. I'm getting better at it. And um, so it's developing relationships with maybe paper mills or another building to, to do sales in. Whatever the case may be, there's a million ways to skin a cat. People got to figure out what's best for them. Now, Booth, besides having that big castle, he has booths outside of it lined with books and cheap books and you know the guy had a lot of money i i uh, well at times i believe he um was given that by family that castle if i'm not mistaken i, I could be don't quote me on that uh but and he spent very uh he, he spent a lot of money on books he, he there was a quote in there like you can never spend too much on a private library he was a frivolous spender when it came to buying books now, Booth was also a very political guy. He was very politically involved in his area. Uh, he printed pamphlets and stuff, too. It, it seems like the town people, they had a lot of fun with him, too. You know, you could you could uh, joke with him and, and riff back and forth and stuff about things. And even if you were at odds end, um, you know, people are people at the end of the day. Most people want what's best. Uh, for their area and, you know, just sometimes at the means to get there, how they think what the proper mechanisms to get to those points uh, differ. They still at the end want what's best for their, their community, their children. And so Booth was pretty political. I, I don't know exactly what you could put a box on him with or a label, maybe kind of libertarian, socialist uh, bent views as well. Um but so he did get very political uh, during his time. He was politically active. And I definitely enjoyed reading some of his points of views, whether I disagreed or not. It, it was interesting. Well, another part of this was his view on the universities. Um, now, he did sell the universities. Uh, but there are some people in the book. One of them was named uh, Ralph. And he was a bookseller. And he refused to sell the universities. And I'm going to read this quote in a minute. But what's so very interesting, what's so very interesting is is the take and the damage that he recognized that was happening to his local area and to the culture through universities. And I'll explain it farther. Um, one, one thing is, is a lot of these universities, back in that day, it was probably easier to sell to them. Uh, Today, a lot of them are going broke. A lot of old-time dealers will uh, recommend selling certain material to universities, uh, but they but they don't have money. They they don't have, which sounds crazy, but a lot of them don't. I've only sold one major set to a university, 
during my career, but I also haven't focused on it or tried to develop a relationship with these people either. Um, what they're basically saying is that universities hoard this material away from the public, generally speaking. And I have a, a friend named Buzz who has a beautiful private Iroquois uh, artifacts collection. And he's always open to the public. He's there to answer questions. He's a really awesome guy and, and, and believes in doing that. And he doesn't want stuff going to universities. A lot of this stuff in, in historical societies as well, it gets boxed up and shelved and you don't see it for years. The stuff I bought out of these places are a testament to that. It might not exactly fit and people think they're doing a good thing by donating. These places are filled. Uh, so I like personally also getting them into private hands. Um, so let's read this quote. So this librarian, Paul McNally, made a large purchase and he was aware that the education system was bleeding rural areas of the young people who could offer much to a community if they were encouraged to remain within it. Local newspapers are full of beaming farmers' sons in academic dress, the first members of their family to go on to higher education. They are brought up to believe that their hometown or village does not contain the opportunities for which their education has prepared them. I regard this manifestation of the brain drain as more important than the poaching of academics by richer countries. The object of higher education is to teach the son of the dairy farmer to work for the milk marketing board. In reality, rural areas need gardeners, not soil scientists. Um, I find this to be very true in even my own area. Uh, not to get too much into it, but a lot of people, there's not much opportunity or so it seems, and they leave for these other uh, bigger areas. And in doing so, it does affect the population, does affect the culture in particular ways that might not be readily noticeable at first, but my graduating class was 100 people. This year, it's 50. It's half of that. Like 15 years later, it's half of it. I think that's kind of sad. Um, there is opportunities in your in your area, you sometimes you got to create your own, and you have to live somewhere. Um, but everybody's been sold to go to university. The 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 prosperities are in the city, and yada yada. And some of this rings true for for sure, I think. But it's very sad to see what it's done to certain local areas. You don't see young people opening up shops or starting their own businesses as much. In this area, there's a number of people I know that have. But in terms of encouraging that, it's usually not really addressed in the public education system. Almost like that option was never recognized. So um, let's get back to this. If I see a book going to a university library, I tell them I won't pack it, claimed Ralph, a well-known dealer by the station in Swansea. And who shot Dylan Thomas, Vernon Watkins, and other Anglo-Welsh poets gather to chat. Uh, go around Ralph's business, depending on recycling books within the community, but gradually he found his stock depleted and no books coming back. Universities were like giant vacuum cleaners. Treasured wealth authors would disappear unread and unloved in an Arizona university. Ralph was unusual in fighting a guerrilla war against academic purchasing. He had the vision to see that putting all the culture of the world in institutions was destroying national identities. At the time, I thought Ralph foolish not to exploit a wealthy market. Now I see that he was a prophet. So, again, I it this does resonate uh, with me, and I believe there is a a lot of truth in it. You know, Booth was very big on culture, and one thing that a lot of the education system seemed to disrupt was the local culture. And actually, I'm going to read a quote from somebody who he visited in the States na named uh, Russell Means. Me Means was a Sioux Indian, uh, you know, very um, uh, po political. Uh, he was an actor and author. He wrote a book called Where White Men Fear to Tread. And uh, Booth went to meet him on the reservation. And Means had some very memorable uh, quotes dealing with this issue as well in the local communities and in particular with his local tribe. And uh, excuse me, this is actually not a quote by Means, but what uh, Booth wrote here. He says, a university graduate is largely someone who has rejected the wisdom of his community. Again, I don't know if you find that to be true or not. 
I have. Um, what's very interesting about like these little bookshops are they're they are like they're preserving culture here. The people that come in, the ideas being shared, the ideas on the shelves, it, it's all a part of of uh, the culture and the discussion. And it's very interesting. I'll have a bunch of older guys here, d different backgrounds, varieties of different backgrounds that people aren't necessarily always going to be exposed to. Um, and they have interesting takes on things. I will say that my area as well, uh, a lot of the older folks, they're not big on technology. Um, a bunch of my customers, they don't have cell phones. One just got a flip phone last year for, for the first time. Um, and, and that's the reality that's been here. A lot of them don't watch TV. They don't have even the internet. Um, a lot of people find that hard to believe, but that's what's here. So their ideas and, 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 and what they're saying is usually a, a little bit different and has a different angle of experience onto it. And I'll have college kids come in there in here and I can tell they're listening, you know, and they might not have thought of some something that way from the standard narrative that they're constantly being that they're regurgitating or being pitched to now they start thinking outside the box a little bit more and i really enjoy seeing it i enjoy participating in that it's a lot of fun but russell basically saw these universities and the public education system as corrupting uh the the youth and uh booth I believe agreed as well with this, according to how he was speaking about. So it's not to get into this big topic specifically, but it really did resonate with me in this book. And I found the points being made very good. If you're interested in the modern day public education system, a good place to start would be with uh, John Taylor Gatto's work, Dumbing Us Down. Look into the background of who uh, Gatto was. You can order it through my Biblio link too. And I actually had the pleasure of picking that man's house. And he was on the short list of my heroes. Uh, but that's a good starting point. And then uh, there's denser material like uh, Charlotte Izzer Beats uh, that, that you can get into on the public education system. But we're going to get back to Booth. So he's very politically motivated uh, in certain ways. He recognized issues within his local community. And he had a great appreciation for people's culture and uh, preserving that and how important it was. One of these things was with minor libraries. He bought minor libraries, and I found this to be really interesting. So these minor libraries um, were basically established by local mining community. When these communities started, started to break down, the libraries were destined to go in a dustbin. Uh, but Booth saw the value in these. And this other guy, this one professor, saw the value in them as well. He wanted to recreate these libraries. It was a futile effort, but at least he made the effort to try. And he recognized value in a lot. He recognized this as being valuable where a lot of people initially did not. That's another part of being a book dealer. is Seeing that value or seeing that opportunity or potential where others may not necessarily uh, right at that moment. And being able to make a move. Um now, these libraries, what they were, uh, uh, was the, they, they consisted of uh, paleontology books, books on the grasses, the shells, stars, fossils, quite an extensive library of wonderful information, time capsule of information and of who the people were and what their interests were in this community. Um, and I, I thought that that was just fantastic. Now, as a book dealer, I can relate it uh, as well over um, where is a similar thing occurring where you where there's an opportunity for you to come in and buy. Another thing was Monastery's booth was m buying out that were going kaput. Uh, he, he would buy all the content in these monasteries. And I, I, again, just thought this was great in giving ideas and seeing how the guy thought and operated. Now, Booth was basically on the forefront of uh, book towns. Uh, he basically created his own book town in his area. They were not popular in the States at the time. I don't even think they existed. Now we have one in called Hobart Book Village, which is about two and a half hours from me. Uh, Larry McMurtry had Archer, uh, what was it called? Archer Books or something out there in Texas, uh, which is a book town. And Booth thought books town, book towns would be the future of the used book business. Um, 
if, and uh, so he would also try to finance, and he did finance some and help create some in Europe. Uh, one was in Spain, uh, and he believed that these book towns should have shops with narrow specialization, uh, such as, for instance, when he was asked by a journalist what that meant, he replied as an example, specialists in the photography of the bee. So he likes specialist markets. He saw this is the way for the future as well. Booth was funny. He would, uh, whatever town was trying to create a book town, he would uh, be the main attraction. And he would grant them with his sword or his staff, uh, uh, basically hit the, their kingdom now. But Booth was the king. So they'd have a fun event, sound like a great time. Uh, of the creation of a book town. A, a part of this was that Booth thought that the small shop and uh, the book fairs were out of date and they were going out the window. I will say book fairs don't seem to be as uh, big as maybe they once were. There is still a lot of interest uh, in them, uh, but a lot of that had to do with things I think was out of the hands too. I mean, when the whole... Uh, COVID debacle happened, uh, you know, they, they went electronic. Um, and so recently you've seen them uh, pulling back a little bit. And But when I go to one in St. Petersburg, I think it's fantastic. I'm sure the New York City one's still fantastic. There, there are some areas where they're slipping a little bit, but um, it's, it's still of interest. And I hope they don't ever uh, go away, obviously. They're very enjoyable for people to see see uh, book dealers' collections and what they have to offer and their specialties. But that's what he thought. He thought that they were going to be a thing of the past. Um, and uh, he thought book, uh, book town model. Was Let's get Booth's view on technology. Uh, this is at the end here. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay. When I began book selling, most academics were of the opinion that the library is the heart of our institution. 30 years later, when they are putting books onto rapidly dating technology for the internet and claiming that the book is out of date, this would appear to shatter their earlier conviction. But events in my life had made me cynical in my expectations of educated people. When customers ask me why, what I think of the internet, I say that I think that the Encyclopedia Britannica may disappear. They, they've always had a fairly low secondhand value anyway, as they date very quickly. But the threat posed to the book by the internet and modern technology has not been reflected by book sales, which continue to grow. I believe that the book as an information system cannot be rivaled by the internet and the computer. The digestion, rather than the mere reception of information, is a major task of our lives. Standing in the middle of a library, the ordinary human being is aware of his inability to benefit from all the information within an arm's reach. Multiplying this a million times over on a computer seems one of the follies of mankind. As the millennium approaches, the human race is having to subsist on another form of communication. 500 years of non-electrical information is challenged by 50 years of electronic technology. It is left to the secondhand bookseller to fight for what, until recently, was the main platform for the traditional and spiritual culture of the world. I believe books will not be defeated by technology, but rather by their sheer physical size. National libraries are bursting at the seams trying to contain the books published in their respective countries. They are dinosaurs of the 19th century and can no more represent the culture of the book than a horse can do the work of a 40-foot lorry. I agree wholeheartedly with what Booth says here. Um, the big libraries don't necessarily <laughs> represent the culture anymore, um, the way they're being curated. And I think that technology has, uh, it's helped me uh, exist in my small locale. Book sales continue to grow uh, yearly. And uh, I think that it's a great tool um, that can be utilized. And one thing that's interesting is like when it comes to universities and selling to private individuals, you're getting these books into generally private individuals' hands and they're circulating in the community more so than maybe they even used to. If dealers were going to the universities to sell as heavy as, heavy as it's alleged to believe they were back in this time, more so then than maybe now. Um, so... 
it's always this double-edged sword, of course. But I do think the bookstores create their own little culture in their area. And it's a beautiful thing. I, I think it's preserving culture. Booth did, and he was big with that. And in his local area, I think this is wonderful for, for people to, to read firsthand accounts of their areas and and uh, thoughts and ideas and sharing in them. It's a really wonderful thing that if, if you ever, if you get to experience it, uh, it's, 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 you know, a lot of people that come from downstate, uh, down in the city, um, that come up here, they uh, really have a lot of appreciation for my shop. They go, shops like yours don't exist anymore. You know, everything is standard, uh, uh, bland retail structures. There's nothing with, I shouldn't say there's nothing, but there's not as much character anymore. All the cars we drive look the same. You know, everything's being kind of standardized and, and everything kind of looks the same. And uh, ju just from my uh, uh, perspective. Um, and so it's fun to throw a character in the mix. Like this shop here. Something a little different. Something off the beaten path. There's a nostalgia about it too. And I think people who have lost that miss it. Uh, um, and they appreciate it. And so long live the used bookstores. And Richard Booth and all the work that he did for his community. If you follow me this long guys. I hope you like and subscribe. Consider purchasing the, the this book in the links below. Very enjoyable read. I'm sure you'll enjoy it as much as I did. This is probably the longest review I've given. So I hope I didn't bore you. Uh, I, I hope you got some value out of this content. And uh, submit your comment as to what book you'd like me to read. For the next review. Book Row or Salamander. And I will pick your name out of the hat when you leave the comment. To win the last bookseller by Goodman, which I think you guys will enjoy out there. That's it for me. That's the end of the show. Hope everybody's well out there. Until next time, we'll see you later.